Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this last lecture on the series on human behavior. Of course, there is one more lecture which will follow where we will uh, review what we did in these 20 lectures in 8 week. But this is officially the last one in the series on human behavior. So, as we have been doing up till now, let us do a quick recap of where we started and where we are now. A more detailed recap that will follow is in the last lecture which is going to happen. We started this series on human behavior with the sole aim of focusing on what is human behavior and why do we need to study human behavior at all. We discussed these questions in detail and then focused on the science of psychology which helps us study human behavior. We looked at how psychology developed as a science, its roots in terms of philosophy and physiology. We looked at older and newer schools of psychology and some pertinent questions that psychology answers. We looked at various viewpoints which are used in studying human behavior through psychology. Then we discussed methods and tools which psychology provide us for studying human behavior. Once we were equipped with this knowledge and an introduction of what psychology is, we moved on to look at how is human behavior manifested. So, we developed one thing that for any human behavior to occur there has to be a change. This change could be in terms of an external stimuli or internal stimuli. So, any kind of change in the environment in a person in a stimulus any kind of change makes a person react to that change and that reaction is called the behavior. So, we started off by discussing how these changes particularly in the external world is recorded and we looked at the concept of what is sensation and sensory systems. We looked at the idea of how sensory systems encode changes in physical environment and convert it into the psychological domain. We looked at properties of sensory system which are sensitivity and sensory encoding, sensitivity being the property of the system and sensory encoding being the process through which sensory information is or changes in the external environment is encoded into the psychological realm. We discussed the process of decision making in terms of what information to detect and what information not to detect. Then we looked at a model system which is the human eye which is in itself a sensory system and how does this system function. Once we have information about changes from the external environment, we need to make meaning of these changes and that is exactly the process of perception. So, we looked at what is perception, how does perception function. We looked at various viewpoints of perception which is the process of making meaning of the external stimulus which makes us behave or which makes us do a reaction. We looked at the process of attention, the first step in perception, localization and recognition which is similar to pattern matching. We looked at these three processes which are used for making perception 
or making meaning out of incoming stimuluses. We looked at two more processes of abstraction and constancy which the brain uses for making meaning. Once the information has been made, a meaning has been derived out of it, this information needs to be embedded or this information needs to be put matched with already present knowledge and that is the process of learning. So, how the new information is equivalent to or fitting already known knowledge or already preserved knowledge is what is the process of learning. So, we looked at what is learning, different kinds of learning, the associative and the non associative form, the various parameters of learning and how knowledge is encoded or not encoded literally, but how this knowledge is matched with previous knowledge which has been already present in human beings. Obviously, the knowledge which has been learned now and the knowledge which is previously with us is stored somewhere and that is where we describe the process of memory. What is memory? How does it function? What kind of information does it store? What kind of uh, models have been proposed for it? What kind of alternatives are there? Characteristics, parameters, factors affecting it and so on and so forth. So, in detail we looked at what is memory. Once new information or information which is encoded by the sensory system made meaning through the process of perception has been attached to a store through the process of learning, this needs to be communicated or used for making or solving problems or for making decisions, for thinking, for making decisions, for solving some problems by human beings. And there are two processes which help in that, one is the process of language which is how we communicate knowledge between people and then the process of thinking. So, we looked at language, what is language, what kind of parameters does language follow, we looked at the English language, we saw how various parts of language are used for communicating information between two systems, two people or uh, two human beings or two beings for that matter. We looked at what is thinking which is the language of the mind, we looked at reasoning which is a support process which helps us in thinking, we looked at direct and indirect thinking, we looked at the deductive and inductive reasoning and how these processes then combine together to help us solve problems. So, we looked at what is problem solving. Once this has been done, we focused on more intrinsic factors which change behavior, internal factors, factors like intelligence. So, we looked at what is intelligence, we looked at the various theories of intelligence, we looked at the common conceptualization of intelligence and then we looked at how does intelligence measured. We looked at a process called emotion, what is it, what are the various theories of it and how does emotion change people's thought process or change people's behavior. We looked at the multi component model of emotion part by part and then we looked at how once a response is generated out of emotion, how these responses to be controlled which is called emotional regulation. Once we were done with the idea of what emotion is, we looked at what is personality which is a stable pattern or a stable way of behaving across people. So, we looked at what is personality, what are its factors and what are the various theories of personality. Those theories which have been proposed which define what is personality and what is the role of personality in human behavior. Towards the end of it, we looked at what is the various methods of measuring personality starting from the questionnaire method to the idea of projective methods to the idea of the newer methods like brain mapping and the EEG or uh, hormone level analysis and so on and so forth. In the last lecture, we took a very, very interesting variable which is up till now we have been looking at how a single individual at the individual unit how is behavior affected, but that we all know we live in societies and so much so that our behavior not only affects society, but the behavior of the society affects us. So, society has a lot of roles since we are social animal, we live in societies, we live across people, we live around people and so these people who are around us also change our behavior sometimes. So, in the last section I decided to look at what is the effect of society or social uh, beings around us, how do they change our behavior. So, in the last lecture we focused on that, some concepts on that and we will continue focusing on that. So, we started off by defining 
what is the importance of society in our behavior? We looked at, started looking at what is social thought. We would define what is social cognition, we will define what is uh, social influence and then look at something called attraction and love, which is again a societal problem. So, we started by looking at what is social thought, which is how do we think about others and so we looked at the idea of what is uh, attribution. We looked at how attribution is caused, the various kinds of biases which can occur in attribution and then we looked at something called social cognition, which is processing social information. How do we process social information? So, we looked at those causes or those features that people use for processing social information. We looked at how people deal with different kind of social information or when uh, information about somebody comes to us, some external factor comes to us, when people around comes to us, how do we deal with it? We looked at various biases in that. We looked at the optimistic bias, we looked at the idea of contrafactual thinking and when we looked at the idea of how we engage in this contrafactual thinking. So, this is what we did in the last lecture. What we will do today is we will continue where we left off and start looking at more interesting things, social influences, attraction and marriage, social behavior and so on and so forth. Now, one another interesting thing in social cognition, we have looked at contrafactuals and we have looked at how uh, optimistic biases and uh, other kinds of biases work in terms of social cognition. It is about how do we process social information. Another interesting thing in terms of social cognition is something called an attitude. Now, what is an attitude? First of all, let us look at what is an attitude and for defining that, let us look at this. So, I am going to write some words here and then what I will do is, I will make you think what do you think about it. So, let us say I write Air India, I write Switzerland, I write Donald Trump, I write Honda and maybe another one ok. So, what do you think about these? What do you think about Air India? When you think about this particular company, what comes to your mind? Of course, some of you would like it, most people would not like it, have the official definition that it is a government company and so they do not serve well, flights are not that clean. Some people would have a thought that in terms of that it is a Indian brand and so the food there is good and so on and so forth. So, everybody has a view about it. Similarly, about Switzerland you would have a view it is a good place, a good tourist place to visit and so on and so forth. Similarly, Donald Trump and Honda and Narendra Modi and so on and so forth. So, each of these words that I have written, when I tell you these words, you start thinking about them. And when you start thinking about them, when you start recalling these words, an associated feeling occurs with it. So, basically attitude is a particular way of thinking about any social information. For example, when I say Narendra Modi, the way you think about him, the way you think how he rose from where he is and right now how he is a good uh, leader and not only a good leader, but a leader focused on development and uh, what all he has done and all the positive feelings that you have about him or when I talked about Donald Trump, the way you react to him, the all the negatives that you can name about him, all the uh, different kind of feelings that is generated in you, not only the feelings, all the sentences that you use to describe him, all of them comprise together to form what is called an attitude. So, let us then define what an attitude is. An attitude is defined as a lasting evaluation of virtually any and every aspect of the social world. So, it is basically an attitude is mostly a lasting evaluation. Now, why it is a lasting evaluation attitude once formed, it is very difficult to change, right. And so, most attitudes generally have a ABC structure. Now, what is an ABC structure? An attitude has an effect related with it, effect is how you feel about the issue. Then we have a behavioral component, which is what you want to do about the issue and C is the cognition which is how you think about it. So, when I say Air India, the like or dislike you have towards this particular company is what is the effect component. The cognition 
is what you think about it. So, you feel one thing and you may think another thing. When you think about it, you, so you think that it is an Indian company, it serves you good food and all. But then there is also a feeling you have attached with it. The feeling is called the effect component and the words that you use to describe it, the thinking that you have about it, the knowledge that you have stored about this company is what is the cognition part. And then there is the B component which is called the behavioral component that is the action that you are going to take. Uh, let us say you are going abroad, whether you want to go with Air India or not, how at the behavioral level when it comes to you for purchasing ticket from Air India, what kind of action do you do is what is the behavioral component. So, based on your effect, how you feel and based on your cognition, what kind of knowledge you have about this company, your behavior will be determined by it and your attitude is defined by it. So, attitudes what are they? These are lasting evaluations of virtually any and every aspect of the social world. It could be any aspect, it could be issues. For example, the issue of women empowerment, the issue of whether a Ram Mandir should be made or not, the issue of religion, the issue of anything for that matter. Ideas, it could be, attitudes could be about certain ideas. Ideas like should we send so many satellites with one rocket, 109 satellites or the ideas that how India should develop in the field of computer science that kind of thing. Persons, any person, Donald Trump or any person for that matter, Sonia Gandhi. So, what do you think about them? What is the idea that you have about them? What is the feeling that you have about this person? Social groups, your attitudes could also about certain social groups. For example, how about blacks? How about the underprivileged? How about the reserve category? How about the mahist? or some other groups. So, what do you think about that? How do you feel about that? What kind of knowledge you have and what kind of action that you are going to take about it? All these will comprise the idea of what an attitude is and about objects. You can also have attitudes about different objects. So, attitude in such are evaluations, are lasting evaluations, but lasting is relatively lasting evaluations because attitudes can be changed. So, attitudes generally involve an effective component like or dislike as I said, this is the effective component a cognitive component which is the belief that you have and a behavioral component which is the action. The cognitive component as I said the cognition, the idea, the belief, the knowledge that you have and the third is the behavioral component which is the action that you are going to take once you know about that particular thing, what is that action that you are going to take and attitudes in itself define social cognition because your attitude about something will define how you process certain information. If you like a person, all information from him will be processed in a, in a different manner. If you dislike someone, the behavior that you do towards this person and the information that you collect from him, how do you process that information is also det determined by how you think about this person. So, attitudes are formed through the basic process of learning like operant conditioning, observation learning and classical conditioning. Now, of course, these are evaluation, lasting evaluations. How are attitude formed? Generally speaking, most attitudes are formed through learning, be it operational conditioning, be it classical conditioning or be it observational conditioning. How? In terms of operational conditioning, attitudes are formed because we reward correct behavior. If we act in a certain way and it is rewarded, certain attitude is formed. For example, let us say that someone from a weaker class comes to you and in your class or in your social strata, you do not give so much respect to this class and so it is a common norm that there is a difference between uh, you and this lower class person. So, most elders, they make this lower class person sit in front of them at a lower chair than where they are sitting. When a small child comes in and he sees his parents doing it and he also does, does the same to this person or any, any person from this group, parents praise them or parents give them some kind of a reward or they, they feel rewarded. And so, when this behavior is rewarded, in future also this child learns that this is what is the kind of behavior that I am going to do and this is how attitudes are developed through operant conditioning. So, if a behavior that you do is rewarded and as a consequence of that, you keep on doing that behavior for the reward, then the consequence of doing that behavior is positive and so, you keep on doing that behavior for the reward or for, for whatever matter possible, then attitudes are formed that way. Attitudes can also be formed by observation learning. For example, when you see a role model do something, for example, very small children, there is a study by Albert Bandura where they on aggression, what they saw was small children 
when they see a aggressive film they see the role model fighting and when they fight when this role model fights he wins over certain enemies so this small children learn it that aggression is good because if i do this aggression then i'll win and so they learn this process of aggression or the attitude towards this particular zombies or to whatever group this aggression was being shown by this role model and so through copying a role model or copying the behavior of a role model attitudes are developed in that way too also through classical conditioning for example in some type of effect or some kind of feeling is developed through classical conditioning because when you feel in that particular way if something happens and you feel nice about it then something gives you a nice feeling because of that you do some act then if that is what the reason is then attitude is positive for example buying shopping gives you a positive feeling and so you shop so this positive feeling which is related to shopping gets attached to it and so attitude towards that particular thing will always be positive because buying that particular thing gives you a positive feeling and so you keep on buying it right so this is the idea of how classical conditioning can affect attitudes now if attitudes are so strong and it is difficult to change and it is it is learned through so many processes how do we change attitude and so one of the ways in which we change attitude is by using something called persuasion using messages to change attitude so changing of attitude of people has been the biggest business of the 21st century and using persuasive message to do so proved to be really effective so one of the things if somebody develops an attitude about something or someone or some event how do you change that attitude one way is giving them correct information one way is giving them an information which is contrary to the belief that they are holding and that is called a persuasive message so this persuasive message this information this new information that you are giving these people how that should be presented is a number of uh, factors have been defined of how to change people's attitude so you can do uh, change a people's attitude by through persuasion now there are certain factors one should remember when using persuasive messages for example the first is experts are more persuasive than non experts if in a ad you want somebody to buy your product let's say it's a toothpaste ad now if you take a doctor with a white coat and he is uh, the one who is advertising rather than some uh, abc a uh, normal housewife who is advertising the toothpaste the expert the doctor is known to create more public or attract more public towards the toothpaste because a doctor a dentist is known to be knowing more about teeth problems and tooth problems and mouth related problems than a housewife and so doctors will be more attractive or more welcome similarly messages that appear to be designed not to change attitudes if you want to change people's attitude you have to design a message you have to write a message in such a way you have to present uh, the information in such a way so that it doesn't appear to hit that person so don't go on saying buy this don't go on saying that i want to change your attitude present uh, your message or present your information which you want to give to these people so that they are thinking or belief about something changes in a way which is very subtle and that is why soft sell actually sells now attractive sources sources which are really attractive which are liked by a number of people they are more prone to creating attitude change than non attractive sources distraction is used to change attitude sometimes when person's attitude has to be changed the real message is given and then at the same time he is attracted by something else for example all those ads where salman khan wears actually a slipper and so the attraction of the hero is taken in and some information through him is forced into you so sometimes distraction is used for you to not question the real issue and change your attitude in some way because if a direct information is given to you people will question it so a attractive source is used and the source in turn changes or fuses in you or sends in you information all those public awareness programs where we use an attractive source and public information a public awareness programs are put through you so that is what it, i'm talking about two sided approach when people hold contrary views when people that you are going to change an attitude already hold a contrary view a view which is opposite to what you want them to believe in those cases you have to present your information in such a way that both sides of the coin the pros and cons of the issue has been presented if that is the kind of information or that is the kind of message that you give to these people then they will accept your view more easily than if you just give one kind of information sometimes emotions are also used for making attitude change and fast speaking people are known to cause more attitude change than slower causing people so in terms of emotion sometimes some ads are used sometimes patriotism is used 
the idea of patriotism, the idea that army is fighting in the war, there are so many news channels which is putting through it. And so, the very idea that you are patriotic and you will buy something or buying Patanjali for that matter because you are patriotic, that kind of thing is used. So, that is also a view to change the attitude. Emotions like you should be using herbal and so that is why you buy Patanjali or you should shift from more organic, shift from more fertilizer based to organic based foods. In those cases also emotions are used and fast speaking people, sometimes people speak very fast and fast speaking people are known to have more expertise than slow speaking people and so sometimes fast speaking people can also cause an change in attitude. Now, there are two different approaches to persuasion. How does persuasion take place? People process persuasive messages in two distinct ways. This persuasive messages, this information, new information that you are giving to people for changing the attitude, they are generally processed in two different ways. One way is called the systematic processing or using the central route for processing to persuasion involves careful consideration of message content idea that it contains. So, one way of sending in persuasive message, one way of presenting persuasive messages to people is in terms of systematic processing. So, give them enough reasons, give the message to them in such a way that they can not only perceive it, question it, think about it, collect more information onto it and then finally trust the message that is called the systematic processing or the central route. In other cases, a heuristic processing mechanism is also used, a peripheral route to persuasion involves the use of simple rules of thumb or mental shortcuts, experts can be trusted. For example, beliefs like, so when a message is important, when a particular information that you are giving to someone for changing the attitude is important, for example, uh, information on cancer cure, information on paying taxes, if that kind of information is given or that kind of thing is given or where somebody saves money, somebody saves somebody's life, that kind of information or that kind of attitude change is required. You give people messages so that they can not only perceive the message, but they can also think and question and then reason and based on that take a decision. But if simple things have to be sold, simple attitudes have to be sold for buying an X brand of uh, toothpaste over a Y brand of toothpaste, in those cases we use the peripheral uh, mode of attitude change or the heuristic processing in which what happens is that we use certain rules of thumb, we use, use some certain heuristic methods of processing information. One I have given you is experts can be trusted, actors cannot lie, organic is always good, this kind of facts, organic is not always good. For example, bitter god juice is not always good, some person actually died of bitter god juice and so that kind of thing has to be there. So, when do we use these different approaches? So, when are we actually using these different approaches? Modern theories of persuasion like the elaborate likelihood model and the heuristic systematic model suggests that we encourage the effortful type of processing when a capacity to process the information relating to the persuasive message is higher or when we are motivated to do so. So, if people have higher capacity to process an information or they are motivated to do so, we use the central route of processing. For example, if an attitude change is required in terms of paying taxes, saving money, saving someone's life and life uh, threatening issue. If those kind of things are there, then people tend to use the central route of processing when they had not only wish to solve a message, to wish to get involved with a particular message, they also have the processing capacity of to monitor that message and they also have the motivation. In contrast, when we engage in less effortful processing, when we lack the ability or capacity to process more careful or when our motivation to perform such tasks are low. Now, issues where what kind of oil should you use to your uh, car or two wheeler? In those cases, most people are not mechanics and so they will trust a brand saying that I will go with Honda or I will go with uh, some company Vidal or something because this is a popular company, Kestrel is a popular company, so let us go with that. They really do not know whether it is a 2 ply, 3 ply, 4 ply or what kind of fuel to use or what kind of engine oil to use. So, in those cases where people are not expert, they cannot process information and also they care very less in terms of processing the information. In those cases, a heuristic or a peripheral route of processing is actually used. So, research suggests that uninteresting or irrelevant persuasive messages produce low persuasion. So, if a message is uninteresting or irrelevant, sometimes ads come with irrelevant information and those ads are the easiest to forget. So, if you are putting an ad to something, if you want to change people attitude, you should always be considering only important issues. Do not mix important issues with unimportant ones because what will happen then is that the whole message will be made irrelevant and so people will not process it at all and attitude change will not occur. Another interesting thing in terms of attitude change is 
how we change our own attitudes. So, persuasive messages, external messages can change our attitude is what we have established. But how do we people change our own attitudes? And one way to look at it is something called cognitive dissonance. Let us take an example. The, you have been in situations where you have what you say and what you do are two different things. There are situations when uh, you go to a friend of yours and so he is wearing all these yellow color pants and a bright color shirt and he asks you how do I look. No matter how hard you try, you do not like it, but you cannot tell it to his face and so you hide your behavior, you hide your response and somehow you say that you like it. This particular thing is what is called induced compliance and this induced compliance actually leads to something called a cognitive dissonance, which happens when what you know, what you believe and what you do are two different things. So, induced compliance, what is induced compliance? These are situations in which we feel compelled to say or do things inconsistent with our own attitudes. What we believe, what we do or what we would have done in a certain situation or how we feel about a certain situation, if there is a difference between that and when we have to or we are compelled to agree to a certain situation, this is called induced compliance. Now, this may in turn lead to a change of private attitudes. Now, you believe something else, but you are saying something else, then this leads to a change of dissonance, a change of unrest and one way to solve this unrest, this dissonance is basically changing your own belief. So, you start saying that, okay, maybe yeah, since I am saying it that yellow color pants are okay, maybe they are no matter how difficult it is for you to believe, but you will change your attitude. Now, the term cognitive dissonance, it refers to feelings we experiences when we notice a gap between two attitudes we hold or between our attitudes and behavior. So, cognitive dissonance occur because there is a gap between two different attitudes that we have, two different feelings about something or it could be a feeling and a behavior that we have. If at the same time we hold two attitudes about something, then it will lead to us causing anxiety or more anxiety to be surfaced at us at us or thrown at us or it could be that we say something and we do something and that can lead to a lot of anxiety and that could lead to a dissonance or that could lead to be a very unstable state. Now, we reduce this dissonance through, so how do we reduce this dissonance? When a situation like this occurs, when you say something or you do something or when you believe two different things about the same thing, for example, two things, let us say uh, birds of further flock together, but opposites attract. Now, at the same time, two different things are being sent to you, two messages are sent to you and believe both of them. Now, both of them cannot be true. If birds of feather flock together, then opposites cannot attract and we will see that in the last section on attraction, how these messages vary. Now, if you are holding a view like that, then a dissonance uh, results, then a situation results when you actually feel anxiety, you feel at unrest and so how do you solve that unrest? One, we can change our attitude or behavior to be consistent. We can change what we believe or we can change how we act in certain situations and that will lead to this dissonance. We can align our behavior according to what we believe or we can align our belief according to how we act, how we feel and that can lead to lesser dissonance. We can also acquire new information that supports our attitude. Sometimes what happens is we do not want to leave or do not want to change how we believe. So, what we do then is we look at newer information, so we look at journals, we look at books which actually support our view. So, maybe I do not like a certain thing or a certain idea. So, I search for more information on why I do not like vegetables for example. Now, the thing is how do I confirm for that? My attitude about vegetable is not good. So, I look at new researches which say that vegetable eating is not good and that will not change my attitude rather it will reinforce my attitude and so I will look for new information because what is happening is that I know that eating vegetable is good, but I do not like vegetable the way it is cooked or for that matter and so there is a difference between these two things and so that is causing a lot of uh, dissonance. So, how do I go low on this dissonance? I either start thinking that vegetables are bad or I uh, totally give up vegetable or I start eating it one way. Other way is I can look at new information which says that vegetable eating is bad or I can trivialize this matter saying that oh vegetable is not that much of an importance to me and so let us not focus on vegetable. So, I can trivialize the matter it has no importance in my life. So, these are called the direct ways of changing attitudes. So, all approaches of attitude change mentioned above are direct methods of dissonance reduction. There are some indirect methods also which I use for reducing attitudes or reducing this cognitive dissonance and so how do we do that? There are a number of indirect techniques to dissonance reduction. One of the steel 1993 suggests that individuals experiencing dissonance may focus not so much on reducing the gap between their attitudes and behavior, 
but as on the self affirmation which is efforts to restore positive evaluation self evaluations and threatened by a dissonance. So, what I could do is if I am not want to change my attitude I can use an indirect method of reducing the dissonance and that is why thinking of something positive. So, if my boss gives a speech and I do not like this speech and I cannot say it on his face also, I am feeling a dissonance. How do I reduce this dissonance? I start thinking about all the positive events that have happened in my life and that will lead to self affirmation saying that I am a good person. So, whatever I am doing is for good right and that way uh, my attitude whatever uh, attitude behavior discrepancy which is happening with the dissonance which is happening the anxiety which is being caused because I do not believe in what my boss says, but I have accepted his view or I have praised him in certain way that will go low. Self affirmation can be achieved by focusing on the positive self attributes good things about oneself. So, what can we do? We can start thinking about all the good things that have happened in our life, all the times when we have been really good, all the acts in our life which has made us who we are or all the pleasure moments in our life and that way I can focus on the good things and reduce this dissonance. The next interesting thing is about social behavior. How does interacting with others, how does that play a role in our behavior or human behavior or our responses. Now, we not only think about others, but also interact with them and in this influence them or are influenced by them also at times. Now, there are certain factors which modulate our behavior, social behavior. One of these is something called the prejudice, which is the distorted way of the social worlds. What is prejudice? It is a certain way of thinking about certain people or certain groups and that makes us or that defines our behavior, right. So, thinking blacks are all thieves, thinking that caste wise people are not equal, thinking that certain kind of religion is better than others. If we start thinking that way, then it, it sometimes reinforces our behavior is reinforced by that and that is what is called prejudice. So, what is prejudice? These are powerful negative attitudes towards the membership of a social group based solely on the membership of that particular group. So, a negative attitude, a negative feeling, a negative belief about a person from some other group which is different from the group that I belong to and why are we having this particular negative feeling? Because this member this person I do not hate this person or I hate is the membership that he has the group that he belongs to. So, hating Ashwadin Oveshi or hating Narendra Modi because he belongs to the Hindu class that he belongs to the Muslim class. So, you are not hating the person you are hating the group and so all negative feelings you have with these people with these leaders is basically because they belong to certain groups. And so, the prejudice that is there is because these people belong to certain groups. So, ideas about these negative ideas about the certain groups and being transformed to the certain people is what is called a prejudice. Where is the origin of prejudice? How does prejudice actually come about? Now, the realistic conflict theory suggests that prejudice stems from the competition between social groups over valued commodities and opportunities. Now, of course, as we saw that prejudices are negative attitudes that people have towards member of a specific group. And why this negative attitude is there about this person? Because he belongs to that particular group, right? So, hating all blacks because they are thieves, because they are not good people, or any other attitude for that matter, and any other prejudice that you have from other prejudice that it could be a positive prejudice also. Prejudice that all North Indians are rowdy, people belonging from the north of India are rowdy, maybe that is one prejudice. Now, or uh, then you meet someone that prejudice occurs with you. Now, this negative attitude which you have towards a particular person because he belongs to a particular kind of a community that we have defined as prejudice. So, how does this prejudice come about? How does this prejudice start? One reason that has been provided is something called the realistic conflict theory and what does the theory say? It says that this prejudice how does this come about? It comes from the fact that good things in this world are limited and so when good things in the world are limited people will actually fight among each others. Right? And so, when they fight among each others, people who are from different communities, they will fight and when they fight, the one community which wins will have a negative attitude, will have a negative saying about the community which loses. Similarly, the community which loses will have a negative attitude about the one that wins, right? because the, the competition is there over all valued communities in the world, all valued opportunities in the world. Right? So, the very idea that why the lower class person get a reject promotion or some kind of reservation and not upper class people all these things are related to prejudice and that is because of this. So, is basically that people are not divided as such we do not or people do not like or dislike people from these different castes strata 
what happens is that since you are giving better opportunities to uh, one set of people and not to other set of people, so these prejudices develop. So, it is because of the realistic competition that is happening in, in a world like this where everybody is uh, the resources are limited and people are competing with each other, the one which wins and the one which loses they will definitely have different views about them and that will lead to the kind of prejudice, the kind of negative attitude, the kind of negative feeling that people have among themselves. Another reason for prejudices to occur is some, something called social categorization and so what is social categorization? The dividing of the world into distinct social categories like us and them generate share contrasting feelings and beliefs that are usually attached to memberships of the in group and to memberships of the various out groups. Now generally speaking when we work in a social world we divide our social world into us versus them. People who are like us, people who are like me will be in the us group and people who are away from me, people who are hold different views are them group. So, dividing the social world into us versus them into people who are like me and people who are not unlike me or not like me and dividing the, uh, the social world into these two parts is what creates a sharp contrasting feeling and belief towards members of the opposite group. So, let us say I have a particular view about anything and a member somebody else. So, I have a view about whether uh, higher everybody should come to higher education or not. Thing people who believe with me that higher education should not be given to everyone they will form one group and on the other hand people who believe that higher education should be given to everyone should will become to everyone should will become to and it will be total opposite and negative. And so, this us versus them grouping of people who believe that higher education only limited people should be given higher education and people on the other hand people believe that everybody should be given a higher education. So, there will be a divide between them and so, this us versus them group will then fight among each other and that could be also one of the reasons of why prejudices develop. Just by dividing the society into two parts, into two unequal parts, into two contrasting parts create some kind of negative feelings in them people will not like each other, people will oppose each other's view, people will not only attack your belief, but your effect system and, and the way you work and that will lead to certain kind of negative attitudes right and these negative attitudes are what is the reason for prejudices to form. Now, persons in the us category are viewed in favorable terms while those in the dem category are perceived as negatively and this is one of the most dangerous thing to do. There are times when people in the other group are much better, but we do not seem to prefer them that is what has been happening in this country. The country is divided into many parts basically two parts the one the Hindu loving and the non Hindu loving kind of thing and so even if somebody is good in the non Hindu loving part they are not preferred or somebody who is very good in the Hindu loving part and say that a non Hindu loving part kind of uh, person comes to power he will not look at those those people who belong to this Hindu loving community he will not give that opportunity because we have because they have this kind of a view that they are contrasting views that he belongs to this particular group and so everything that this group believes or everything that this group stands for it is also embedded in him. What people tend to forget is that there is something called individual differences, every individual is different. So, I might support some views of the group, I might not support some other groups, but when I am tagged with a particular group, when I am put in a particular group, what will happen is the group feeling will come over me, the group feeling will embarrass me, it will form around me and so I will be tagged like that. So, no matter how much different I think on certain views or my views are different on certain issues, I will be tagged with that particular community and so that is one of the reasons that can actually lead to prejudice. Now, we acquire prejudice attitudes through learning. How do we acquire prejudice? We acquire prejudice through learning. We acquire them from people around us through social learning. Basically, these prejudices are acquired through a process of learning. We see our elders, we see a role model act in a certain way and when he acts in a prejudiced way, he is rewarded. So, all those people who talk nonsense about the other community, other group, they are rewarded, they are given better positions, they are given something else, they are given some kind of favor and when we see that, we also start following that particular thing. We learn that this behavior is what is appropriate because as the behaviorists say that those behaviors which produce consequences 
positive consequences are liked. This is called associative learning. And so, we associate that okay, then doing this behavior is going to give us positive consequences, whether it is getting a good job, whether it is getting some kind of favor, some kind of money, whatever it is. So, we start behaving that. We acquire this kind of a thing, with this kind of a learning or this kind of a prejudice from people around us through social learning. We look at models and what, what they do and so we learn from them. Countless experiences where teachers, parents, friends express prejudice views make children acquire them the attitude. We see our parents, we are, see our teachers, we see our friends, we see people around us that we value in the us group. They behave in certain ways and so when they behave in certain ways they are rewarded, they are praised they receive all kind of high accolades and so this is how children also start learning this prejudice. They never start valuing individual for that matter, they start valuing the group value, the group thinking, the group idea. So, they can no more see people as different, they see people as belonging to certain categories and certain groups and the group dynamics or the group characteristics becomes the characteristics of the whole person and so that is one of the ways how you acquire this prejudice. There is another interesting reason of another interesting way in which prejudices are acquired and that is through the role of stereotypes. So, what are stereotypes? These are cognitive frameworks consisting of knowledge and beliefs about specific social groups. A stereotype is a particular kind of a thinking or particular kind of cognitive framework consisting of a knowledge and belief about certain groups. For example, Maoist let us say, people who belong to uh, the Chakma or people who belong to the Naxal groups. Now, what do you think about them or how do you think about them? These are people who create trouble, they kill people, they have all kind of unnatural demands and then all those things. So, basically there are stereotype. It is believed that everyone in that particular group has this attitude, has this belief system, they think this way, they act this way, this is who they are and this is how this is defined. And so, naxalized are defined in a certain way. This is called a stereotype. Now, as I said, each human individual is different and so, when we start stereotyping, it actually helps us in certain way. So, all natural are in the same way. So, no matter who it is, it is in the same way. That helps us in creating the prejudice or in forming prejudice about people. Suggesting that by and large all members of these group process certain traits and at least to a certain degrees. All blacks are thieves and so no matter who you see as even the, the most famous black person that you would know, he would be tagged with that particular thinking process, he would be tagged with that particular name for calling or that particular trait and so on and so forth. Now, once an individual acquires a stereotype, he tends to notice his information that fits the cognitive framework and remembers consists facts from memories. So, once you have tagged that information, once you start believing that backs are not good, they are thieves and they are not uh, educated and they are low maintained people, what will happen is as soon as you meet a black the next time, what will really happen is you although he might have good facts, what will happen is you will only start looking at those facts, those information which fits your cognitive framework of how most blacks are and so you will start finding those information in this person, finding those traits in this person which matches your cognitive framework. So, maybe this black is very helpful, but what will happen is of course, if you push someone to the limit, he will bark back, he will act back. So, you will push him to the limit till the point of time that he attacks you and then you will say that look all blacks are bad. And so, that is what happens in terms of stereotypes also. So, stereotypes acts as a labor saving device. Why do we keep our stereotypes? The reason why we keep our stereotypes is that because it saves us, because it helps us in making quick and dirty judgments about people. We really do not want to go through the whole process of attribution. So, what we tend to do is we tend to take stereotypes or form stereotypes and what the stereotypes actually do is it is a time saving device. We do not have to then attribute reasons to anybody's behavior say that okay he is black and he is supposed to do this kind of an act and that saves us in certain way. They also individuals to protect and bolster their social identity. That way prejudices are also stereotypes also helpful. So, how do we tackle prejudices? One way is learning not to hate. So, one way of tackling prejudice or learning how to reduce prejudice is learning not to hate. So, discouraging the transmission of bigoted views while encouraging more positive attitude towards others and that way what will happen is a prejudice will lessen down. We can also increase the contact between people from different groups which lead to realization of similarities between people. If we mix people from both the groups, if we mix people from a number of groups, us versus them groups, we will come to know about other people, we will come to know how similar we are to them in what ways and how different they are from us and how similar they are to us. 
us and that will form common similarities and that will also make us like them. So, one way is increasing contacts between people. Also, resetting the boundary between us and them. If we can reset on the boundary, if we can lessen the gap between us and them, that can also lead to lesser prejudices. For example, recategorization, somehow inducing individuals to shift the boundary between us and them reduces prejudice. So, if we can use a process of recategorization where boundaries between us and them are reduced in some way, so that people interact more often or people are recategorized as more often or forming new categories of assigning people or making people within the Hindu versus non-Hindu, you can also have people educated, non-educated that kind of new boundaries, new categories. If you can do that, then it will reduce the prejudice. One way of reducing prejudice is through that matter. The next thing that you want to look is social influences, how do we change others behaviors or how others change our behavior. Social influences involves attempts by one or more persons to change the attitude or behavior of one or more others. Three important terms are there. How do other people change our behavior or we change other people's behavior is what is called social influences. Now, there are three different things to be looked at. One is called the conformity. Now, what is conformity? Pressure to think or act like other people stemming from the fact that in many contexts there are spoken or unspoken rules indicating how we should behave. When you tend to conform with other people, tend to agree with other people, this is called conformity whether you like it or not. And there is a very simple experiment which Solomon Ash did to show conformity. It is a very simple experiment what happened is that he had people selected, a participant selected and this participant was sitting with 6 or 7 confederates of Solomon Ash. Now, he did a very small experiment which is called line judging experiment. So, there are 3 lines on one slide and one line on the other slide and people were supposed to judge how this target line is equivalent to or whether this target line is a part of this line or not. Now, on many of the trials, 9 confederates or 7 confederates that he had actually agreed with the participant. But on some trials, the confederates actually gave a very disastering answer, where he gave an answer which was non-believable to the target, where you can very easily see that this line does not belong to any of them, does not fit to any of them and there are multiple versions of it. There are sometimes when these 7 people deliberately make mistakes. What do you think will the participant do? Will he confirm, will he agree to those 7 people who are wrong? Yes, that is what happened. Most participants actually agreed to what the whole group was saying to be wrong or to be right and this is what is called conformity. It is the pressure to think or act like other people. Now, what does this conformity come about? Why do people confirm? One is called descriptive norms. Tell us what most people do in any given situation generally appropriate desirable behavior. We start thinking there are certain descriptive behavior. We start thinking that these are the rules which are there, these are the things which of how we should be acting in a certain way and so we start responding to it. And the other is something called the injunctive norms which is specify what should or should not be done and not merely what people do in certain situations. So, the reason for this conformity is descriptive norms, it, there are certain norms which are there which tell us what people do in a given situation generally appropriate or describing behavior and there is something called the Injunctive norms specify what should or should not be done and not merely what people do in situation. So, inductive norms say that what people actually do and injunctive norms actually say what should be done or uh, what is possible or what should be done. So, in an accident, the descriptive norm says that you should take somebody to a hospital and the injunctive norm says that you actually have to take somebody to a hospital and it is not about what should be done. Uh, it, it is about what should be done and not what mo most people do. In descriptive norms is that most people actually run away in an accident. In injunctive norms is you should help someone. So, why do people actually comply? Why do they actually go with this? So, in the Solomon ex experiment where the participant very well knew that this line is not equivalent to any of this line, but then he complied with the 6 participants or 7 participants who rated this wrong is because he felt something called conformity. So, why did he conform? Why did he comply to other people? Each of us has a strong desire to be liked by others. One of the reasons is that he thought that I do not want to look bad in front of so many people and so that is one of the reasons. He wanted, he had a strong desire to be liked by others. Now, experience teaches us that one way to reach this goal is to appear to be similar to others as possible and so that is why he complied. We conform to others as we have a strong desire to be right and to hold the right views, dress in the right style and so on and so forth. So, one way is that we should be liked by others. The other way, the other reason why these people complied is because they believe that there so many people in the group cannot be wrong, they have more information than me and so they cannot be wrong and so they complied. Compliance, they conform rather. 
compliance. Uh, when we want somebody to do something for us, we use certain tricks to getting people to say to us or comply to our request. Now, when we want somebody to do something for us or we want some, somebody to help us in certain way or act for us in certain way, we use certain kind of a tactic. And what are these? Tactic based on liking. The first is tactic based on liking, ingratiation which makes people like us, help people in complying with us. So, we use certain tactics of liking. For example, self enhancing tactics, enhance personal appeal. We can dress nicely, we can speak nicely and that way people will like us and they will do whatever we want them to do. Or other enhancing techniques, we can use a flattering target persons. We can praise the other person saying that you are so good, you are so nice and so on and so forth. So, the other person will do what we want them to do. Tactics based on commitment or consistency. We can use also something called the foot in the door technique. And in this what we happen is getting others to say yes to our small request are based on obtaining an initial small commitment from the target person. So, what happens is in, in the foot in the door technique what happens is initially you go to a, a person and uh, what you do is you ask them very, for a very small help. Now, when this person gives you a very small help and you praise them in certain way, later on you can ask them to give you a very big help. What will happen is the person believes that okay, when I have complied to him for the smaller help, I will always comply. Let us comply for the bigger help also because now I am thought of a helpful person. So, you start by making people say for very small uh, things and then later on ask them for bigger things. You can also use a tactic based on reciprocity which is called the doors in the face. So, you start with a bigger fact. So, in the first case what happens is ask someone for let us say 10 rupees, he will give you and then later on because 10 rupees is not too much of a matter, later on you can increase the value to 1000 rupees and because he has helped you with 10 rupees, he will think that he should help you with 1000 rupees. The other way around is the door in the face is ask someone for 1000 rupees, obviously he will say no then ask him for 10 rupees. Now, you will say that I have already said no. So, a second time no is not good. So, maybe he gives you 10 rupees and so this is called the door in the face technique. Instead of starting with small request, we start with big request that people put down and then make a small request. Now, tactics based on scarcity playing hard to get, there is another tactic which is used for complying, a tactic in which individuals try to create the impression that they are very popular or very much in demand and that way also people comply to what you want. So, you start saying that oh I am so good everybody wants me and so people other people respond to what you want them to do. Obedience which is social influence by demand. Now, most influential way one can change other people's behavior is through something called direct orders. So, direct orders like in army if, if a major gives an order everybody has to comply to that and everybody has to show obedience to that. Simply telling the other person what to do. Now, why people show obedience? The source takes the responsibility of the action. Why people are obedient? In the army, why does soldiers follow what the general says? Because they believe that it is the responsibility of the major. If something wrong goes, the major is responsible or the general is responsible. Sources hold clear signs of authority. The major actually has a good voice, a good command and so he, he holds that actions or he holds that signs of authority. And second, commands to be carried out by gradually. Now, not all commands are given at the same time. These commands are given one by one and so because of that people follow obedience. The last section that we need to do is something called attraction and love. And what is it? Similarity. The more similar people are to us, attitudes, personality and habit, the more we like them as such persons provide us validation for our views or our personal characteristics that make us feel good or like them. So, why do we like each other? Because of they are similar to us in, our, in terms of the personality, in terms of their habits, in terms of the attitudes and so on and so forth. Affective states, positive feeling or moods. So, why we like, like other people, why we like certain people and not like other people? One reason is something called similarity. Other reason is called affective positive states. Whatever their source causes to like others, we meet while experiencing them, while negative mood causes us to dislike others, we meet when we are in a feeling low. So, when we are feeling good and we meet someone, we generally like them. When we are feeling bad and somebody uh, is introduced to us, we actually dislike them. And so, affective state, the way we feel when we meet someone also has a uh, large influence of how whether we like someone or we dislike someone. If positive feelings are produced by something another person says or by the way the person looks, we tend to like that individual. So, if somebody says good and we feel positive, we like that individual. But even our positive feelings have nothing to do with the person as in the unexpectedly high grade incident or if we meet someone in a pleasant setting. So, we like someone because it feels positive because we meet them in a positive sense. Physical attractiveness is another reason. The most important factor affecting interpersonal attraction is something called physical beauty. Research suggests that 
we are suckers of pretty and a handsome face. Physical attractive people make us feel good. Why do we like pretty people? Because they make us feel good. Physical attractiveness is associated with good health and good reproductive capacity. When we meet someone who is attractive, he's good, he's good looking, handsome, pretty, what happens is we are associated with good health and they are also related to good reproductive capacity. What makes people attractive? What are the factors which makes people attractive? Now, it depends on a lot of cultures. However, most people agree on what attractiveness is and what is not. Among women, two distinct patterns of facial features are viewed as attractive. For example, a cute pattern involving childlike features with large widely spaced eyes and small nose in the chin, for example, Meg Ryan on one end and a mature pattern involving prominent cheekbones, high uh, eyebrows and a pupil and a big smile, for example, Julia Roberts. For men, there are two clusters of attractive features. For men, a youthful appearance, for example, Leonardo DiCaprio or you could have a mature masculine feature like Harrison Ford. So, these are the settings which have been done or these are the set of characteristics of people who are attractive. Judgments of attractiveness do not depend solely on facial features and are influenced by other aspects of physical appearance as well. What is it? Physique is an important determinant of attraction, at least among young people. Person whose physique matches the popular model currently slim but muscular tend to be receiving a higher evaluation than people who are departing from this model. So, physique is another important factor in making people attractive. Love, the most intense forms of attraction. What is it and how do we know it? Romantic love is a form of love involving feelings of strong attraction and a sexual desire towards another person. There are other forms of love like compassionate love, but we are not dealing with it. We are only dealing with uh, the romantic love. Now, there are three components are central to the romantic love. Now, before we can say that we are in love, the idea of romantic love must be present in culture. So, when we say we are in love, what do we mean? That we, this idea of love should be present in our culture. Second, we must experience intense emotional arousal when in the presence of the appropriate person. So, if there is a uh, person who we fall in love with, but we do not feel that intense arousal, then we cannot say we are in love, though intense arousal should be there. Now, these feelings must be mixed with the desire to be loved and the object of our affection coupled by the fears that the relationship might end. So, it, not only that we love this person, but we also should have the fear of ending this relationship and that defines love. So, love how and why it occurs? Romantic love often develops quite suddenly. People report that falling in love feels like being struck by an emotional lightning. So, we are all prepared to fall in love by our early relationship. So, how does it happen? It occurs because either we are prepared by some other relationship. So, we had some kind of a fallout and so that, that is there. Through the ages, the reproductive success of our species depends on two factors. Now, desire on the part of both men and women to engage in sexual intercourse or an interest in investing the time and effort required to feed and protect our spring and these are the reasons of how this romantic love actually occurs. There are times when the love dies, when there is no love at all and what happens, why, why does it happen? So, when a partner discovers that they are dissimilar in important ways, love can be weakened or even die. So, one reason. Another and potential serious problem is simple burden. A third reason is jealousy which can undermine relationships. A fourth is change in patterns of effect. A fifth is partly function of early childhood experience, people differ in their attachment style. So, they may not be attached at all to start with and interactions that can only be described as self-defeating patterns of behavior sometimes emerge and that can lead to the falling out in love or the dying in love. So, this is where we end the whole section on human behavior. What we did today is we looked at some more patterns of human interactions or social group interactions. We started off by continuing with what is social cognition, looking at what is uh, attitudes, looking at what is prejudices and stereotypes. We looked at social influences, the idea of how we comply or how we confirm to uh, certain things and what kind of people are who actually show obediences. And towards the end of it, we looked at certain attachment styles, we looked at what is uh, attachment, what is similarity, what is love and what that kind of factor. So, all in all, these kind of social pressures, these kind of social behaviors also changes our own behavior or sometimes our behavior also changes social behavior in certain way. So, not only our behavior is changed or manifested or modulated by our internal factors, social factors, other persons outside of us also change our behavior in a lot of different ways. This concludes the whole section on human behavior. and. Uh, we will have a final section where we will uh, start looking at what we have done up till now in too detail. But uh, what you can do is there are certain portions in this lecture which has already been covered in a parallel course which will be running this semester. Maybe it sometimes also does not run and that is a course on cognitive psychology, introduction to cognitive psychology. You can also refer to that course where 
things about learning, things about uh, memory, things about thinking and uh, problem solving, those have been covered in detail. So, some parts of this lecture have been covered in great detail in uh, on the course on uh, perception, sensation, these have been covered in great detail in the course on cognitive psychology. So, what I will suggest is while taking this course, what you should also do is refer to that course and that course could also give you a lot of insight. As this is the last lecture, I wish you all success in the doing this course and so thank you from here until we meet in the last uh, lecture where we summarize whatever we have done in this course on human behavior. Thank you.